So this is our new title behind us. And the questions that we're going to ask um, is, why is there so much anger? When is it helpful? When is it harmful? And how can it be addressed or harnessed for productive change? And I'm Margaret Levy, and I'm starting off the discussion. My own focus will be on some of the sources of the anger in breakdowns in perceptions of the trustworthiness and legitimacy of government, so closely following on what Giovanni Tria just said, but with a slightly different take. But I will also speak to the conditions under which mobilized anger can be transformed into organizations and institutions that improve democracy and the political economy. So trustworthiness of government and other institutions is for me a set of objective attributes. Trust is about personal relationships, A trust B about C. Trustworthiness is about a series of objective attributes of a government or another organization. That means that people can assess mistakenly whether those attributes are met, and we see lots of cognitive mistakes and other kinds of mistakes that are made. Um, but there also can be variation in those assessments among different populations within the same country. So I want to speak to that a little bit. What causes these breakdowns in perceptions of trustworthiness of government? I'm going to focus on government. One of the most important is if government doesn't deliver the goods that people feel is part of their fiscal or social contract with government. But an equally important, and one that we're seeing to be playing a very important role today, is the failure to meet standards of procedural justice. And those standards vary among countries and sometimes, um, and over time, and sometimes uh, across populations. But there are also objective breakdowns in procedural standards of justice. Um, differential experiences by different populations with relevant agencies of government to make that more concrete. The Black Lives Matter movement in the US, which is clearly very angry about the way the police is treating um, African Americans and particularly young African American men, and with good reason. But that doesn't mean that they necessarily distrust every part of government. They clearly distrust the police, but we know from other kinds of evidence that they have some confidence in the courts. This population has some confidence in the courts and other agencies of government. Uh, one of the books that I've read in recent years that has most impressed me was Arlie Hochschild's Strangers in Our Own Land which uh, is a sociological, anthropological account of uh, the people of the Louisiana Bayou and why they seem to be voting against what many of us would think would be their interests, given the deterioration in their environment, given which they recognize, given the health uh, problems caused by the pollution of their waters, by the corporations that they work for, um, given a whole variety of other things, and yet they've become active members of the Tea Party and then active supporters of Trump. But part of what's really bothering them is procedural justice issues. Uh, one of her great metaphors is that these are people who feel like they've been standing in line for a long time waiting for their just due, for their chance, and they see all these other people, whether it be blacks or immigrants or others, uh, women, um, getting in front of them in line. I just was in Estonia a week ago, and the Estonian Russian speakers are furious because they feel like they have not been treated fairly. So we can see this all over the world. These are people who may be getting some of the same delivery of services in terms of the goods themselves, but how they're treated and how they perceive themselves to be treated is I want to also talk about, there's also breakdowns in legitimacy of government, which I see is different than the trustworthiness of government. Trustworthiness of government has to do, as I said, with objective standards. Legitimacy requires uh, some agreement on accepted and widely shared justifications for government selection and government actions. And that's based on moral principles and beliefs. So I'm glad John is following me because this is really his stuff. And one could argue that there's a loss of shared consensus on those uh, 
moral values and beliefs, though I think John's take is a little different than that because it's, it really has to do with the salience of certain values over others um, and the contestation among that, and he will explain that more. But I want to argue that there are ways to coalesce around the values that people do hold in common. And they hold a lot of values in common, though they may value them, if, if you will, differently. They may hold different salience for those values. So what are some of the reasons for this breakdown in trustworthiness and legitimacy? And we've heard a lot of those reasons already given today, so I'll just quickly go through my list. The, one of the most important for me and part of what I've been working on is how to deal with the fraying of neoliberalism as the political economic framework under which we've been living but which is no longer working for many of us in both the United States but all over the world. It's not delivering the goods, it's implicit values are contested, it's model of humans are flawed and we've learned a lot in social science over the last bunch of years about how humans, re you know, they aren't perfectly rational, they aren't narrowly, always narrowly self-interested, et cetera, et cetera. Um, neoliberalism is not delivering on its promises of a better future for our children. And we, as we just heard in the last panel, has, we've been experiencing a loss of dignity and respect in work as well as in politics. We also have problems with leadership. Um, with social media and other source, socially constructed sources and forms of information which heighten the salience of those differences and the contestation over those values. But there are nonetheless real differences and real differences in treatment that need to be recognized and reconciled through construction, I would argue, of a new moral political economic framework. So anger is a form of protest. And there are problematic variants. I mean, and that's how I think we have to read it, and that's our starting point, and then we want to figure out how to make it productive. And there are problematic variants, and we've heard a lot about those today, that are racist and nationalist populist, populist movements based on exclusion. And I would call those exclusive communities of fate, not faith, fate, F-A-T-E, with whom is our, our destinies in what I'm more interested in doing is developing expansive communities of fate. Um, nations, at nationalism, as Andrus Wimmer told us, helps us deal with strangers, helps us be reciprocal to strangers or to give to strangers, at least within our own countries. But so do disasters, forests, and floods. That tends to evoke from us a willingness to give to people who aren't part of our immediate group. Um, but we'd like to get beyond that um, and think about groups that, that would include refugees, for instance, people who are coming into the country, immigrants. And one of the things we've been seeing in recent, uh, recent times is young people mobilizing around climate change for themselves because they're concerned about it, but for future generations. So they're, they're acting in the interest much larger set of others, a larger community of faith. So anger is there, but protest, I want to argue, is not enough. It can translate into toppling of regimes, a la Arab Spring. It can translate into leadership change in government, whether it be Trump or what's happened with Brexit all over the world. But these have limits unless new governance institutions and arrangements are part of the plan. And we see that in some of the most successful revolutions in the world, the American, the Russian, the Chinese. The Russian not done so well in recent years, but it was a successful revolution for a while. And I would say the union movement is a very good example of the translation of social movements into organizations. And in a book that I wrote, we're all citing our books, in a book that I wrote with John Alquist, In the Interest of Others, we use union examples as many forms of government to think about how variations in governance institutions and arrangements can evoke or not evoke this expanded community of faith so that people will engage in actions, costly actions, on behalf of very distant others. They close the ports and could be fined and 
uh, lose their jobs, uh, even uh, be hurt or murdered by the police, um, on behalf of very distant others who can in no way could reciprocate directly. But the governance institutions have created this sense of responsibility and a set of obligations to others. So the importance of organization and governance institutions is one of the things I really want to emphasize if we're going to think about how to translate anger and protest into something that has some progressive possibilities for democratic policies, politics, for creating expanded community of fate that overcomes parochial distinctions. Now, I can't think of organizations and governance institutions without thinking of Robert Michaels or Roberto Michels, depending on which country you've decided to place him, um, with his tendency to oligarchy. But it's not a law, it's a tendency, and it can be avoided. And I, we show, in, in the interest of others, ways in which that can be avoided and then think about how to scale that up. So let me conclude by saying that brings us back to the problem that, that Ned and um, Joe really started us off with today, and others have brought up as they've been talking. How do we generate a new political economic framework? One that I would call a moral, I think all political economic frameworks are moral, but how do we create ones that makes its values um, explicit and whose values actually meet the populations that they're meant to serve and aren't just top-down imposition of values? that outlines reciprocal uh, rights and obligations among citizens, governments, firms, NGOs, religious organizations, et cetera, what Joe Stiglitz called a new social contract, that provides guidelines for policy based on values of the populace as well as their needs, and revises or even creates economic institutions that are appropriate to these times and to this era, and we've heard a little bit about that. But I also think it requires revising political institutions, not only in terms of uh, improved accountability and electoral systems, which clearly happen in many, many countries, but also think of really innovative and new ways of providing for voice and forms of democratic power to the population itself and provide means for enabling an expanded community of faith. Thank you. Well, it's, it's really an exciting day to, to get to think about these three political ideologies and movements, uh, all of which are in tension and in conflict with each other. And uh, my, my talk today is going to be focusing on nationalism. This was the revised uh, title of our whole session, focusing on anger. And mine will focus on, on nationalism. Um, <clears throat> But I'm going to try to tell the story about it, which is not just about what's wrong with those people, um, which is a common view that people take in the academy, uh, but rather looking at the way that nationalism and progressive is in particular sort of rile each other up and, and mutually cause each other. Uh, and so here we go. There certainly is a lot of anger in the United States. This has been said to be the key to understanding the 2016 election. And of course, all over Europe, as many of the speakers have said today. Um, and of course, just recently, one of the most spectacular examples being the, the uh, Yellow Vest protest in France. So this is a, was not just a thing of a few years ago. This is an ongoing issue in all of our democracies. And today we heard a number of people talking about the role of, of uh, inequality, stagnant wages. So there are many, many economic causes, of course. That's a big part of the puzzle. Um, I'm a social psychologist, and like most social scientists who are not economists, um, we are either envious or resentful or something towards economists who, who uh, get to, uh, who have such access, and we're left to sort of, you know, snipe and criticize from the wings. At any rate, what I'm going to say today is that, of course, economics is important, but I think it's less than half the story. And Margaret got, uh, got us started by thinking about trust and uh, shared fate and uh, procedural justice. I'm going to add a little bit more to that picture. So... Here we go. So I actually, I wrote an article um, just before Br the Brexit vote happened. I wrote an article uh, and submitted it, and then it was published after the Brexit vote. But um, I'm going to try to tell a story in three steps or three chapters that I hope will help understand, uh, understand nationalism a little better, and it'll build on some of the remarks that Professor Wimmer gave this morning. So 
my story, it doesn't begin with the nationalists. It begins with the globalists. I think you must understand the globalists to understand uh, nationalism at present. Here's the story. Uh, two propositions here. First, that a set of innovations that first came together in Europe has created prosperous and eventually peaceful societies. About that, I think there's, there's little doubt. Um, but here's the more psychological claim, that peace and prosperity change values, minds, and cultures. They create a different kind of person, a kind of person that has never before existed in human history. Um, so we've all seen versions, a version of this was shown, I think, in, in uh, Professor Stiglitz's talk this morning. Uh, there was an extraordinary thing that happened, uh, especially in Northern Europe, Western Europe, and the United, uh, the United States, North America. Um, in almost the blink of an eye, uh, the rise in GDP per capita, the ending of extreme poverty, um, all happened very, very quickly in, in the West. And that led to a shift in value. So many of you have seen these sorts of images from the World Value Survey. Um, agricultural nations are on the bottom left, and then as they industrialize, they move up, and then as they enter a service economy, they move to the right. And so you get these, um, uh, these emancipatory, secular, rational values, which I think really can be called progressive values. Values move in, a, in what we would currently call a politically progressive direction in general. Human rights, gay rights, women's rights, uh, um, the environment, things like that. So you get these uh, societies in the upper right that have recognizably progressive values. Uh, here's the, the, really the most powerful quote on this from one of the authors of the World Value Survey, Christian Welsell. He says, fading existential pressures, that is when you're no longer worried that you're gonna be killed in the night or lose everything next year, when you're no longer worried about this, this makes people prioritize freedom over security, autonomy over authority, diversity over uniformity, and creativity over discipline. This is the change that wealth and security causes around the world to people's values. Um, but it's, it happens not to everybody. It happens especially to the cosmopolitan elite. You get the emergence of a kind of person that we now would recognize as perhaps meriting the label a globalist. Now, whenever I think about this kind of value system, I just go right back to John Lennon's song, Imagine This Is the Globalist Anthem. I mean, it really bears rereading the words to the entire song. Imagine there's no countries. And if there were no countries, there'd be nothing to kill or die for, and then no religion too. And if we could just get rid of all that stuff that binds people into coherent communities, shared fate communities perhaps, get rid of all that stuff, and then we'll all live in peace. Oh, also no private property. That's one of the later verses. So, um, and the world will be as one. Now this is the globalist anthem. And it is not just embraced by people in the cities per se, it's embraced by people on the left in cities. And so here is um, an interesting personality scale. It asks a bunch of questions, things like, how much would you say that you care about or feel upset or want to help when bad things happen to people in your community, your country, or people anywhere in the world? So you ask a bunch of questions using that frame, and here's the data uh, that my colleagues and I collected at our website, yourmorals.org. And so people who register at the site and say that they're very conservative or on the right, they put their country first, they care more about people in their country, uh, a little above community, and then people in the world in general is lower. They still care, but less, okay? So that, you might think, is that's a kind of parochialism. You're putting your close, close people first. Uh, but look what happens to people on the left. They say they care more about people far away. They care more about people in the world in general than they do people in their country. So this is a very direct rejection of this idea that the nation is a community of shared fate. So that's step one. Rapid economic progress and security creates a globalist mindset that does not, it's not only it doesn't like nations, it actually dislikes nations and national borders. Step two is that because of the enormous prosperity and openness of such societies, they are magnets for mass immigration. Um, that's the proposition A. Proposition B is such immigration then rouses the concerns of the nationalists over the predictable sorts of conflicts in Europe and America, culture wars over burqas, Christmas, food, language, crime, all sorts of things that recur in, our, in the Western nations. So here's how it goes. Throughout history, whenever there is prosperity in one place and starvation in another, people move. They do not want to die. They hear that there is food elsewhere, and they move. Um, 
Uh, it was ever thus. It was thus the Irish potato famine that uh, sent so many um, Irish people to the United States. And of course now with the horrific long-running wars in Iraq and Syria uh, and the horrors of ISIS, uh, um, many, many people have chosen to leave, to flee, to take their chances and often die on the way to Europe. In 2015, of course, there was an historic, or I shouldn't say historic, there was a very large uh, increase in asylum seekers. Germany took the most total, but of course Sweden took the most per capita. So things really change immigration-wise in Europe, as we all know, around 2015, uh, you have a new situation. Now, how do people react? In Europe in, in, and in America, the left generally is pro-immigration, pro-asylum uh, uh, pro seekers, and so you have movie stars, I think that's Susan Sarandon, you have movie stars going out with camera crews to show them welcoming boat people uh, in, into, into European countries. Um, you have people on the left saying that um, patriotism is a bad thing, they're opposed to patriotism, patriotism is racism, why should you put people in your country first, that's racist. Um, and so when they say things like that, what effect do you suppose it has on people who are patriotic? What effect do you suppose it has on people who are not urban intellectuals on the left in the cities? What do you think effect, what effect do you think it has? Many people then say, well, get the hell out. If you don't like it, get the hell out of our country. Um, in France, uh, or all over Europe, many conflicts, especially over the integration of, of Islamic customs, which are often incompatible with the gender neutral, or gender equality of many European countries. So in Sweden, I was there in 2017, and there were a lot of debates at the time about how to, how, how to accommodate or uh, what to do about the new Muslim, the influx of, of Muslims. So uh, should we make our swimming pools be single sex at times? And so there's a lot of debate about that. And it's, I think it's captured, at least the, the view of the nationalists is captured in this meme, I don't know if it was ever printed as a card, just an internet meme, please tell me more about how you came to our country and now want us to change our traditions because they offend you. Um, so again, you can see there's this rising tension within each country. So that's chapter two. This rising tension then triggers what we can call the authoritarian alarm in a subset, 20 to 30% of the population of each country, each Western country. So here I'm drawing on the work of Karen Stenner, a political scientist who now lives in Australia. This extraordinary book, written in 2005, but my God, it is a guide to what is going on now in Europe and America. People should read it or her, or her more recent writings. Um, and what, what Stenner argues uh, from her research and her dissertation and afterwards is that, of course, there's authoritarianism out there as a psychological trait. We've been studying it since the 1940s, but here's her key point. It's not a stable personality trait. It's a dynamic. It's a kind of mindset that comes out when it feels threatened, but not threatened in the way that you might normally think. It's threatened not by like my wages are going down. It's threatened by what she calls normative threat or moral threat to the community. So there are three kinds of normative threat. If you perceive widespread disobedience to group authorities or authorities are, or you perceive authorities are unworthy of respect, um, if you see lots of people not conforming to group norms, you feel like things are coming apart, pink people are not following our customs, our norms, um, or if they perceive a growing lack of consensus and group values, again, diversity run amok, we're coming apart. Authoritarians in particular really need a sense of a shared moral order. And when they see immigrants or anyone else coming in and breaking that up, they get very, very authoritarian. So you can threaten them in her studies. You can threaten them with news about, well, say Donald Trump saying Mexican rapists are coming over the border, and that will make people who are, have this mindset not just be more prejudiced against Mexicans, but about gay people or African Americans. It's a, it's a pervasive mindset. Um, and so this is sort of the, the bad or the, 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 the ugly kind of nationalism um, from Professor Wimmer's talk. Now, um, Richard Nixon very consciously exploited this exact mechanism when he ran for president in 1968. And um, Donald Trump, we know from one of his campaign advisors, specifically modeled his uh, um, Republican National Convention speech after Richard Nixon's, very much the same strategy, uh, and his claim, again, Mexican rapists are coming over the border. That's a perfect way to press the button. It's as though authoritarians have a button on their forehead. In case of normative threat, activate authoritarian tendencies. And that's what Donald Trump is very, very effective at doing. So that's, um, so that's chapter three, the authoritarian alarm. Um, the, uh, whatever the reality is, now that we're, now, since social media and its configuration since 2013 pretty much keeps the authoritarian button pushed really hard at all times, everywhere, and this will always be the case. So the, it's very hard to imagine how we get back from here, but this is now where, where we are. A few points about what to do now. 
um, uh, any sort of policy implications if we want to create more open sorts of societies. Uh, I think Margaret's phrase was, what was, you had a really nice one there. Well, anyway, it was about uh, new economic frameworks, oh, expansive communities of faith, that's it. Um, how to do that. I think you have to do your best to turn off the authoritarian alarm, and in the long run, you have to make sure that the centripetal forces in a society, that is the forces pulling towards the center, are stronger than the centrifugal forces, which are the forces pulling outward. And so very briefly from Stenner herself, uh, and she's very much on the left here, but she was upset back in 2004 that she saw progressives and progressive activists doing exactly the right thing to do to, to maximally energize authoritarians and push politics to the right. And she is freaking out now about, about what, uh, um, what the progressive movement is doing uh, in, uh, today. So she says, we can best limit intolerance of difference by parading, talking about, and applauding our sameness. Ultimately, nothing inspires greater tolerance from the intolerant than an abundance of common and unifying beliefs, practices, rituals, institutions, and processes. She says, and regrettably, nothing is more certain to provoke increased expression of their latent predispositions than the likes of multicultural education, bilingual policies, and non-assimilation. So there are a lot of policy implications here. Uh, to illustrate it more visually, uh, if you imagine especially a, a multicultural, multi-ethnic, uh, secular society like the United States, always in danger of pulling too far apart, how do you keep the forces in balance? Just my short list of centrifugal and centripetal forces. So, uh, for example, Sweden would have more, they, they would sort of, their starting position would be stronger centripetal force rather than, say, the United States. But linguistic diversity, a re re relatively recent uh, founding, a variety of things there would tend to maximize centrifugal forces. So every policymaker should look at this, not just inequality, uh, not just uh, procedural justice, uh, but the, all those matter, but these forces as well. And so that is my story um, about why it is that nationalism um, tends to beat globalism, or at least when there's a surprise at the polls, it tends to be that the nationalists did stronger than was predicted, not always, there have been a few the other way. Um, and that is my story, and that is my explanation of how moral psychology can help us understand nationalist populism in three chapters. Thank you. Well, thank, <clears throat> thank you very much for inviting me here to express my uh, uh, similar or diverging views on uh, why there is so much anger, and maybe there's time for a few words on what to do about it. I think uh, this story has to start with the early 80s when Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan came to power in the North America, in the United States, and in the UK. They sweeped to power with very big um, majorities and very big impact. Western de democracies have been dominated by their neoliberal consensus where alternative views have disappeared or were marginalized. I mean, these views sort of swept over the Western world and more or less everything else disappeared to the sidelines. Partly for their own making, they had been uh, uh, delegitimized by failures in the 60s and 70s and time was ripe for something new, people wanted change and this was the change. The common denominators were, as you know, deregulation, more room for private solutions and less for public solutions, accelerated international integration, including open borders, more imports and competition, and more migration. And uh, in one word, more market, less politics. Politicians sort of uh, stepped back and did not take responsibility for things. You remember maybe Margaret Thatcher's famous uh, story, to, to, to call for the government to create jobs is like to ask the medicine man for rain. That politicians has nothing to do with this, and don't blame us, don't demand this from us. The results of this uh, uh, rather dramatic change of political and economic consensus uh, almost consensus, I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit because time is running, uh, was of course that nations changed. Winners won and losers lost. Uh, 
and their losses were very visible and heartfelt, particularly in country, countries with underdeveloped safety nets that left losers alone, families as well as entire regions. It was what some people call a win, that we've heard today, a winner-takes-all society. Inequality increased dramatically. We see many charts about that today. Deregulation and globalization of financial markets guaranteed winners freedom from taxation, while working families had to carry a larger share of the total tax burden, as they were the only ones who could not sort of escape the taxman. Important consequences were that many people felt like strangers in their own land, to use another common phrase of today's discussions. After 2008, everything worsened. The decline made more people feel behind and outside, and, uh, and um, uh, economic policy had no answers and no credibility. It was sort of left empty-handed, there was a big vacuum. And this, of course, as one could expect, led to a demand for alternative views. It became an easy sell to, to blame outsiders. Immigrants, China, globalization, Brussels, or politicians. Those who did not do anything, those who did not take responsibility, they were not in charge, they did not pretend to be in charge, and people were left alone without, without leaders. Not only uh, did this happen, this, uh, I mean, the, the, the easy sell to, uh, to blame outsiders, not only did this happen uh, in countries experiencing decline or stagnation, uh, in stagnation of wages or stagnation of GDP in countries like US, France, Italy, or in the case of US stagnating uh, middle class incomes. It also happened in other countries with strong, rapid wage growth, rapid GDP growth, rising prosperity, like Norway, like the other Scandinavian countries, Sweden, Finland, Denmark. So my conclusion is that Stagnation and unemployment cannot explain, at least it's not enough an explanation why nationalist populists or, or populist parties uh, took over so much influence in our countries. There were additional factors. Inequality, even, um, even when um, prosperity was growing, like in Norway and Sweden, it was quite visible how some people were rushing ahead much more than others, even if their were, wages were not stagnating. Neither is immigration an explanation, because we could see this in countries that re took no refugees, no immigrants whatsoever. We saw the chart here a while ago. Uh, Sweden and Germany took a lot of immigrants. Poland and Estonia did not. There's no difference. Norway took very few. They have the most influential right-wing nationalist party in Europe, probably, against all the conventional wisdom that this has to do with unemployment and failed economies. Um, so we have to look elsewhere for explanations. Traditional politics had no answers. Many started to look elsewhere. My view is the reaction is understandable maybe even sound, that, that uh, people felt the old recipes aren't working, we must find new ones. But my problem is that traditional political parties failed to channel the anger into action. They had simply no answer. In Europe, action and debate was totally obsessed by the euro crisis, to saving the euro which I think was far away from the daily realities of people hit by the crisis. This was sort of aloof things doing, done in Brussels in nightly dramatic negotiations. Crisis policies in the, Euro, in the Eurozone aggravated the problem by tightening social safety nets and uh, for those already on the losing side. UK, Italy, Greece, uh, particularly 
in those countries and in all countries outside the big cities, in the rural areas where the populist parties had their, their, their best uh, recruitment grounds. Nobody listened to, to people there. Nobody talked about them. Everything was far away. Brexit came as a surprise, maybe not so surprising. Um, Le Pen, the Five Star Movement, and uh, Salvini in Italy. And, um, and this was like a response to this feeling of nobody listens to us, nobody sees us, nobody talks about our problems. And so they looked for completely different alternatives that wanted to throw everything overboard. With such underlying forces being built up during decades, present anger and uh, discontent is not surprising. The issue we are expected to solve in this panel, at least the original title we were given, Strategies to Calm Discontent, there is only one strategy to address the underlying issues of inequality, lack of support in times of structural change, um, the discontent we're seeing in Europe and America is understandable and well-founded. It should not be suppressed while the underlying causes remain. Instead, it should be seen as a healthy reaction, a force for change. Without it, present tre trends could continue indefinitely. So what could we do? Time is almost running, so maybe I should leave it here. Uh, <laughs> I have a few points. <laughs> we must realize that it took a generation to arrive here. It cannot be undone with a quick fix. If you hear people with quick recipes, well, stop listening, that's it. This will be with us for a long time. But a turnaround of bad trends can quickly be translated to optimism and gradually to more trust. Rate of change is important, not only the level you achieve, but have we re uh, reached this far, we must change the trend soon and then have a long time of another trend, I think. My second point is that mainstream politics should restore trust by introducing effective new policies that would change course. But there is, of course, a slight little problem. The dominant consensus of the past generation still dominates and no credible alternatives are to be seen. But to focus on distributional effects and quality of life aspects for middle class citizens could take us a long way. Health and unemployment insurance, stable financing of schools and hospitals, rather than tax cuts for the few, the way we have seen it in some countries like the US and some countries in Europe as well. Next point. I believe that the more fair distribution of incomes is hard to achieve without trade unions that can negotiate from a position of strength to make sure that the fruits of uh, the productive sector can be distributed fair, more fairly. But this requires a broad membership of unions and, this is important, legitimacy and respect among the general public. For some unions, in some countries, this would be a real challenge. But that, is, that would be necessary. My, last, my fourth point, inflation does not seem to be a problem for the foreseeable future. That creates room for accepting higher capacity utilization and lower unemployment that in the, uh, than in the old world where the threat of inflation held demand back. Countries like Sweden, many other countries where we had to tighten policies when, unemployment, when, un, when employment started rising too fast or when unemployment were falling too, too low. Those, connect, those relations aren't there anymore. Maybe they will come back, but as long as they're not here, those mental restrictions that economists, central bankers, and many of us still have because we've had them for a lifetime, they must, we must now figure out new ways to think about this. My final point is this, and now I'm speaking as a Swedish social democrat. There's been a lot of talk about Sweden today. I've tried to refrain from it, but here I am 
speaking as a leftist politician. Structural change is not an enemy, it's a friend and ally, although sometimes a difficult one to handle. All efforts should focus on supporting and facilitating it. Ambitious safety nets, education to support innovation and new ideas, generosity towards families and regions affected by the declining parts that change, that change contains. This is the structural change, the gradual modernization of the, our economies, the decline in some areas to make room for rise in other areas, is needed for rising wages and increased prosperity for the many, but also for our common global challenge of climate change. Thank you. So I'm uh, the discussant, and uh, um, at one level, bringing these different views together uh, would be quite a challenge. Um, I thought about this. So I'm going to present my own views, um, <laughs> discussing why I think, in fact, um, there, there are many missing pieces to the anger that is there, and perhaps focusing on um, different sources might point to different uh, potential for change. So, so in general, um, let's see. So the, there are two, two sources of anger that I think haven't been really much spoken on today and one that has been spoken on that I don't think is very important. The, I, the one that I think is very important, it lingers with us today, is the events of 07, 09. The, the crisis events, terrifying um, and powerful. Um, the efforts of political actors to foster ethnic division, racial hate for political ends, uh, augmented by social media, I think that's had a very important, regrettable effect. The non-effect is inequality. I don't think that's had much to do with the anger. And the reason my, my, my evidence for that is I'll sketch is because um, uh, the measures to redress inequality have no political backing. Uh, we, we seem to be raising the estate tax exemption. Uh, we seem to be cutting the rates paid by the best well off, so, you know, I don't think the anger story from inequality is right, that uh, Rawls had the true view to work and did not on the distribution issue, but anyway, so, to proceed. The events of 07 or 09, terrifying. The United States faced the real risk of, of the c collapse of financial firms, sector. With it would have followed the collapse of the U.S. economy, the global economy, Great Depression, to squared. Um, I taught classes as that was going on. It was a frightening time. Um, when I came to school, you walk by the ATM and think, maybe I should withdraw money now because not sure the money will be there later in the day. Um, and it's important uh, to remember that moment because without it, you can't appreciate the extent of the rescue measures that were taken, which had the effect of rewarding, so it seemed the least deserving, the Wall Streeters, penalizing, uh, penalizing Main Street, um, which triggered tremendous anger, of course. Third, the measures proposed to protect some of those injured, those measures were themselves attacked as rigging of the system yet again. And so you may remember that the Tea Party, which a very powerful, angry group, arose to express fury at 
the mortgage relief provided by some of those facing a, a, facing a foreclosure on their houses, the Tea Party response was they bought houses that they couldn't have afforded and they don't deserve relief. So the anger was not only at the Wall Streeters, but also at fellow citizens who, who might themselves uh, get, get um, some, some benefit that wasn't available to all. The Tea Party anger, again, affected the pursuit of austerity, or the, the, the austeritarian policies, which certainly now we think were a mistake on many different dimensions. Think about the ferocious anger to the extension of health health care to those who needed it. Angry about that, a measure that took nothing from anyone except gave something to those others who didn't have it. I mean, that's an angry response. The, the legacy also, the anger, was also against the elites who had first uh, brought us into a, a terrible war and now couldn't run the the worldwide financial system. So that anger, and, and none of them went, went to jail for either cause, that anger lingers today. And I think we can't appreciate the current environment without appreciating uh, the, the events of merely a decade ago. Life plans were destroyed. The unemployment was severe. The dislocation effects were very real. And I think we've yet to recover, certainly in the U.S. and also, and also in the EU as well. And, and the irony, bitterly, was that some of the rescue, right, the interest rates that are so, so low have done, what have they done? They've raised the asset values, stock prices of the wealth held by those who were not the deserving beneficiaries. So that's one particular thing. Uh, the second, I think, is, is there's been a, a rabble-rousing. There's been the, the uh, use of ethnic division for political ends. And think of Yugoslavia as an example, where um, political actor Milosevic roused ethnic feelings that had been in a sort of a... a uh, had, had, had been, been there in a low-key key way for a long time, I'm not saying we're close to that, but I'm just saying political actors pursuing division on ethnic racial lines can create tremendous amount of anger. Um, it's true not only in the US, but in the UK as well. Finally, on inequality. Um, well, Rawls and Dworkin had, had a debate about the risk to the civic state. For Rawls, the religious concern was much greater than the distributional concern. Um, and by, by religion, we might include ideology, identity, um, culture. I think that's proven to be very more important than the distributional concerns, which bring, brings me to inequality. There are two types in the current debate, one of which is the 0.01% against everyone else, high salience, but the N of the truly rich, both in, uh, and including the dollars involved, are low compared to the US economy. The serious inequality debate that isn't as high salience is between non-college students and college grads, non-college, uh, the income level has been declining over a long period, at best flat. For college and professionals, the income is, has, has, has increased over the period. Um, that inequality challenge is much more, it's, it's, it's much harder to get our hands, hands around and to figure out how to m manage it going forward. Um, but inequality has not, I think, has, has been politically potent. 
Uh, I mean, as I said, uh, uh, the estate tax has been reframed as the death tax. And somehow folks are persuaded that um, the estate tax is, is an effort to, to deprive them of the capacity to pass on any inheritance to their kids, right? Uh, if we're serious about inequality, obviously that's a very important element to focus on and uh, probably more important and easier to do than, than, than a wealth tax. Uh, in the U.S., inequality is a serious issue, I think, because it's been brigaded to political power. Uh, in, in a peculiarly perverse element of the U.S. system, the U.S. Supreme Court has said, in effect, uh, money is speech, and we aren't going to limit the amount of speech that anybody can have, no, no matter how rich. And so some of the barrier to resolving many of these issues, I think, is, is precisely uh, that. And that's a reason to be angry. So um, I think we have time for... If Lizzie gives it to us, we didn't use all our time. I'm sorry? If Lizzie lets us. Oh, no, no, we, no, we budgeted in 10 minutes so, of discussion. In. And then, yeah. and no, 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 we, yeah. we, we trim, trim, trim yeah, time. We and so, so what do we have total? About 10 minutes. 10. So uh, we wanted to hear from the audience responding to the different perspectives that I think were uh, presented by the panel. And uh, so. My goodness, has the audience had, had, had folks? <laughs> Well, I think, we, so what action should we take? I think first, maybe we should s settle among ourselves. Uh, we had two people who focused more on, on financial economic issues, whether in inequality or responses to the crisis, and then we had two focused more on sort of moral social causes. So I guess maybe we could have, each pair could give you some recommendations. Um, although I would actually just, if I could just pass it over to, to Leif briefly. Um, it, it, so in Scandinavia, the three, the, Four countries, three countries. Are you saying that you don't believe it was because of normative threat, uh, immigration responses to, to Islamic immigrants? You think it was mostly about inequality? Well, uh, several things. Uh, uh, size of immigra immigration cannot explain the Nordic experience. It's, it simply doesn't fit. So there but must the be. The perception. But, but it could. It could contribute, could be part of the story. Uh, the, uh, I tried to add a few factors together, uh, summing up by saying, change is very fast. People feel disoriented. They don't feel at home in their own land. And in this case, the fact that the cities don't look the same because there are people there who are not blonde anymore, people who speak other languages in the subway or in the bus, Children in the school have friends who cannot speak Swedish. Maybe that is part of it. But Sweden took a lot more immigrants than any other Nordic countries. But Norway has a stronger nationalist populist party with influence than Sweden. They have more racist violence than Sweden. Finland has started very, very late to allow any immigration whatsoever. They have, uh, by a very, very slight margin, their nationalist populist party, the True Finns, was number two in the election and not number one. I think the, the difference was 0 0.2 or something. And in Denmark, the most influential political party that has used its influence <coughs> they, to stay out of the government by forcing everyone who wanted to form a government to follow their migration policies uh, although their immigration numbers aren't as big as the Swedish ones. Wait, but the so, actual numbers so It, it don't simply doesn't much. fit to say it's because of this. But the, once this um, emotion of things aren't under control, I don't recognize myself, I f don't feel at home in my own country, once that starts um, taking root, I think it's more accidental what kind of political movement will canalize this, will channel this into political action. I'm convinced that in Britain it was Brexit. Brexit, Brexit got very little to do with the anti-immigrant forces in, in Northern Europe, although they channeled the same thing. 
Um, we talked about... Well, there was a response to the Polish immigration. It was yeah. partially a response to immigration. High, high levels of Polish immigration. Partly, yes, but not Muslim immigration no. from and Iraq Polish. and Afghanistan. Yes. It was blonde Christians from Poland, Estonia, Latvia. It didn't have that... Uh, yeah, but they still felt like strange, some felt like strangers in, in Sweden and Denmark and Norway. But, but the, one of the things that I think is really you're emphasizing structural but equally important is the perception of what is going on and how information is constructed about what you're what you think is happening so um, you know, one of the things about what, one of the things I look at is the statistics about crime. We just, you, you gave an example of Trump talking about, you know, I'm gonna make you safe on January 22nd. As soon as I'm president, the cities will be safe again. Well, the cities have been safe for years. The crime statistics have been going down in American cities. And yet he played on a trope that wasn't even true that people in certain parts of the country believed um, without any evidence. So some of it is perception and how that perception is being played. And the other thing I wanted, I mean, you were, I just want to reemphasize that I think part of the solution to all of this has to be some institutional change. That it can't simply be, um, we really need some economic change and we need, you were emphasizing as well, as well as some political institutional change that really transforms the capacity to pe for people to get together, to have discussions, to resolve some of these value differences, um, to share information in a different way, to be able to challenge the information they have in a space which allows them to then learn um, and then to uh, be able to express voice and vote in a very different right now. Well, I, uh, I don't know if anybody was moderating, but I saw Philip Howard in the back row. I'll ask him to yeah, yeah, yeah. give a question and then. Yes. But I don't think it's. But I don't think it's centralized government is the problem. I think, in, at least in the United States, one of the things, and you mentioned this, Leaf, one of the things that we've lost is the labor unions, and other intermediate associations, that have always played a role in sort of containing the discussion. So a lot of the people that we now call the Trump voters wouldn't have been allowed to talk that way in the past because the unions would have disciplined that or the religious organizations that people used to belong to would have disciplined that. And that doesn't mean there wasn't racism, that doesn't mean there wasn't distrust of various government agencies, but we've lost these intermediate associations, which are also a crucial part of the story. So I don't want to leap just to the central government as being the problem. I would like to agree with that. Uh, it's not, the, uh, not necessarily the central government who tells people what to do, I, but I would, suggest another one, the national media, which forms much more of people's perception of the time they live in than politicians do. And they also, the way they show politicians, politicians meet their voters through the intermediation of the media. And if media shows them, ha, has an agenda that is, let's say, dominated by big city values, so we have and people in rural, and people in rural areas would then feel that people in the big cities, they sit there on their expensive yeah. apartments telling us what to do. Right. And they feel yeah. exactly the thing that Howard is, is saying, but by somebody else, not necessarily from politicians. And politicians who would say the opposite could be, could be killed in the media. Thank you. Perhaps this is a question for Jonathan. How do you 
talk about the moral psychology of leadership. So specifically, we have a major problem in this country of a national debt that's out of control, annual deficits, and both parties, political parties, the left and the right, the elites are behaving as if, as if nothing is happening. So how do we reestablish trust and confidence in leadership? What is the moral psychology of leadership? We don't seem to have any at this point. So, so I think any kind of leadership uh, is, is, is a kind of both persuasion and a rallying. And um, so I think leadership always needs to ground its, its appeals in moral foundations. Um, this is something that um, uh, both uh, George Lakoff and, and others who've criticized the Democrats for a long time have pointed out uh, that they don't speak a, a broad enough moral language. That's something I've been talking about in, in, in my book, The Righteous Mind. Um, and so a, a leader now in a country, I think, would need to be able to speak in ways that acknowledge the concerns, not just of their own party, but of the other side. I think Obama was actually quite able to do that on the campaign trail. Obama, I've looked at his language very carefully. He would talk about the founding fathers. He would talk about things that made it clear he was patriotic. So in his campaign speeches, Obama was able to reach out somewhat. Um, once he was governing, I think there was much less of that. But I do think that um, the tendency often to speak uh, in terms of policy benefits and, oh, our, you know, the Democrats traditionally would say, well, our policy will give you more money. And that's not the way to win people over. Uh, you have to think more about being almost a quasi-religious leader and how do you bring the congregation together. Okay, so. <clears throat> So my proposition for the future is what I call new pragmatism, which is heterodox economics and economic policy, our strategy for development, somehow different from progressivism, socialism, nationalism, but close to social market economy. But I put in addition that at the time of irreversible globalization. So in my train of thought, social market economy is compatible with globalization. And my question is to life in Sweden, you have accepted relative to the number of people, to the population, the greatest injection of immigration from different parts of the world, from different cultures. How it is sustaining the social market economy reality in Sweden? Does it help you to stay the course or is it making a continuation of social market economy more difficult or impossible? How would you address the, the question? That's a, a very good but also a bit difficult question. In the short run, the massive influx of immigrants, of course, uh, is draining resources in Sweden. How do we, for instance, in just a few weeks, hire 1,000 teachers in Afghan languages? It's, it's, it's impossible, but when 15, 16, 17 year old boys came from Afghanistan looking for asylum. I mean, very big short term problems. And, uh, but let, let's evaluate it, this by looking at the previous big wave of migration we got into our country. That was in the 90s when the war in Yugoslavia was, was going on. We took about 100,000 refugees from Bosnia and some, mainly from Bosnia, but also from other places. It was quite difficult in the beginning, but they are now very, very productive, and they are, have higher incomes, they are more educated, they work more um, than the average population. And we get some stars in some areas. Maybe some of you have heard of Zlatan Ibrahimovic. It's not only in, the, in sports, but also in science and other places where we've been able to use the talent. We don't know now what will happen to the, the refugees who came this time. They came from areas that are very different, from Syria, from Iran, from Iraq, from Afghanistan, from Somalia. I think that the people who came from Syria were middle class. They paid a lot of money to come to our country instead of staying in Jordan or Lebanon. I think they will, they will thrive and make it well. It will be more difficult for refugees who came from Somalia and Eritrea, for instance. We don't know, but uh, in the first, first phase it cost money on the budget. But the funny thing is, it was an injection of demand in a situation where there was lack capacity and rules-based budgetary policies that forbade these kind of things that were suddenly put out of place by the migration wave. So the first effect was a rapid rise, acceleration of GDP growth, a rapid rise in employment a stimulus to the economy that was very, very positive for the numbers. Uh, 
So the paradoxes are everywhere here. But of course, we cannot escape that this will cost a lot of resources before this, uh, this 150,000 people are integrated in society. Other questions? Yeah. Ned. Um, I've been arguing, uh, as some of you know, for some time that um, one of the problems is, maybe an underlying problem, is that uh, work is no longer exciting. It's no longer engaging, no longer involving, no longer fun to the extent that it was several decades earlier and going right back to the 19th century. And then I've, I've also been arguing that to some extent uh, it's our fault because our values have, have um, decayed, so to speak, and, 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 and uh, people are not looking any longer for, for, for jobs that offer these, these non-material rewards. Uh, they're, they're, they're just looking for the money. And then when they find as a consequence of that that their life is meaningless, uh, then they get angry. What do you think? I, I'll, I'll I try to speak so. to that. I don't think so either. Um, I think that people um, are frustrated by the kind of work that they have, but it really has to do with the fact that they're not getting dignity and respect at work. And, and the dignity and, and respect can be through wages, it can be through a variety of ways in which they're interacting at the workplace. At, Ned, let me, let, so there are people who have lost wages too, and there are people who have to walk, work multiple jobs in order to survive. And that's, that's a loss of dignity for them. When they used to have a state, you know, they used to, their parents had stable jobs, okay? So those are kinds of things that are happening. So there's a material, there's a feeling, a perception of material problem. There's also the fact that the work is no longer um, a place where solidarity happens, where people are interacting with each other. There are no water coolers. There are no unions. There are no, uh, there are no uh, ball games that are played by the members of the of the workplace. So being engaged isn't really just it's it's also and and we don't respect a lot of the work. This comes back to the values that you were talking about. There's you know we don't the the city dwellers don't necessarily respect the farmers. Um, people treat care workers like they're nothing, when in fact that's a real skill. We don't teach our teacher, teachers well, and we're seeing them begin to mobilize. So I think it has a lot to do with people feeling respect and dignity, and that kind of what you're calling engagement, I think, is really coming a lot from that, and not from feeling that the job has to be meaningful. A lot of people have always had jobs that weren't very meaningful, but it, they could provide for their family, and they, they had buddies. <laughs> I disagree. I, uh, maybe that's the case in your country, but I don't recognize what you're saying. I think more people have responsibilities in the workplace now than 50 years ago. I think people are entrusted with more decentralized decision making in most organizations. On the job. I think um, more, uh, fewer organizations now use the old military command structure. Maybe they are more common in American companies. Some people say so. But I don't believe in our modern economies that companies can survive and thrive and grow and have creative uh, employees with a military command structure. But very, very big corporations sometimes use it because that's the way to organize things. You send numbers up and you get decisions down. But uh, that's not the way... To, to do with that anymore, I think. Although, the, okay, um, it, it, it's hard for us to assess whether people enjoy, enjoy work or, it would, of course, it would depend on the industry. But I think what we might say is that, again, the reality, the objective reality doesn't matter so much. What matters is the perception and it's relative to your expectations. And I think we can say with some confidence that people in the middle class and above expect more from work than they used to. And so even if they have more autonomy, even if there is more distribution, what people expect to get from a job, I think, is much, much more than it was in previous generations. Uh, I think so we can combine to that, maybe building along, Ned, I think the way, you're, the way you're thinking here is that people have a sort of a sense of a loss of engagement. Well, let's look beyond work. 
Um, to the extent that people need to live in a sense of a sort of a moral order that they think is shared, that has been weakening and weakening and weakening, certainly in terms of any sort of religious uh, participation, by far the fastest growing self-label is spiritual but not religious. So I think we do see people increasingly unmoored, uh, living in a world that seems anomic or normless. Social media, I believe, has shredded any possibility that we will ever again have a shared fabric or shared set of, of uh, shared understanding of reality by ever again I mean in the next 20 or 30 years who knows what's going to happen in a thousand years but for the foreseeable future I think our sense of engagement in a common mission with a common set of facts is on a downward trajectory uh, thanks to the panel and to the audience and um, so anger <laughs> <with your laughs> passes, yeah.